Hello, everybody out there in ChefConf. Uh, thank you for attending this year. Um, today, we are going to have a roundtable talking about the communities of practice. Uh, my name is Mike Butler. I am a solution architect here at Progress Chef. Um, with me, I have Brittany Woods and Nate Farrell and Mandy Walls. How are you all doing? All right, Mike. How are you? Excellent. Good. I know we have a limited amount of time on this, so let's jump right into it. Um, what do you guys, uh, how do you define, or who wants to define what community of practice is? Don't all jump at once. <laughs> Brittany, what, what, what's, uh, I know you, you're big in the communities of practice. I know you've run a couple of them. Um, tell me how, a little bit about uh, those communities of practice. So the communities of practice for me is is just building a group of like-minded people um, as, as you build and proliferate like a product or a platform across your organization. Um, and in doing so, giving them kind of a vested ownership and in, in, in the future of that platform or, or practice that you're you're trying to promote um, as, a, as a means to, you know, achieving your goals, right? Yeah, I think it. I think a lot of it's like focusing around a common um, domain, and domain being the product or you know anything that you are practicing all together. Mandy. Yeah, I would say um, all of those things. Plus, often they are self-organized, self-mobilized. Right? It's not often a like an executive scheme that someone high above you is putting together and saying, "Hey, you know, go talk to these people." It's more that uh, folks who are doing similar tasks or working with a similar product are having, starting out usually as informal, maybe even whisper network kind of conversations. Hey, do you use this thing and what are you doing? And and then sort of self-organizing from there. Yeah, when, when do you uh, think communities of practice are needed? Like what is it that it sort of takes to like get that going? I don't know that there's a hard rubric like some organizations are fine or more comfortable having folks being a little bit more dissipated I guess you could say doing their own thing um but to really get to that flywheel effect with something especially something like chef where you want a lot of teams to be doing a lot of stuff with it um you want to organize something yeah I think I think that's a really good point of like something that's big or whatever that you need to organize a lot of teams for. I think uh, one of the things that I've noticed is whenever you have complicated platforms that you're trying to roll out to a lot of teams, um, it's it's a means to making them more comfortable with adoption yes. um, and, and promoting that adoption. Uh, so I feel like it's really necessary, like the bigger the group and the bigger the platform or the changes. So like, if you're trying to roll out DevOps to an organization, that's not like a small feat. Um, oh, come on. But, right, but like, if you're telling somebody, hey, like go go write the script in PowerShell, like you probably don't need to build a community around that. But if, if you have this big, this big like game changing or, or process changing idea that's going to significantly significantly impact the way like a team or a business works or functions um i think it's almost critical to to start looking at ways that you can help them and usually communities of practice do that to expand on that a little bit too i think a, a good marker for organizations that are kind of wondering if a community of practice is right for them are typically when you go from one team consuming a product to multiple teams to kind of elaborate on that scope and that size. You know, once you have multiple teams doing something, it becomes really hard to keep doing the same things, especially when it comes to best practices and tips and tricks and communities, communities of practice are, are essential to me in, in kind of ensuring that everyone is following that best path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Um... Chef is, is one of those times, they're one of those places that you do need to have folks come together because you end up with application people doing cookbook development, you have a compliance team that's doing development, you have um, OS standards that they're building and just maintaining their, their the baselines. But having communications with all of those, you know, that's, that's really important to have um, everyone communicating and talking together. Uh, one thing where that is very, very critical is 
if, if you have a little less structure, how things are, are, are pushed into the environment, or even if it's not like having other people to lean on to say, Hey, I'm having this issue with my code. You're not on an island. You can go and talk with other people. Um, so where I found, uh, one, one thing I found really helpful to, to start driving that is, um, running office hours. So where I came from, we, we used to run office hours a couple times a week. And sometimes we'd have, um, you know, five people from the same team. And other times we actually had really good participation and had 20 people on the calls. Um, you know, it's important to be consistent. Have you guys ever done office hours? Yeah. So, um, in, in the communities that I've, I've been a part of and, and kind of led or, or started to lead, um, we didn't call them office hours. Uh, we called them user groups, but essentially they, they were tantamount to the same thing. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, largely they had really good participation, but I think that the more, the more information you can provide up front, uh, the more somebody can determine if that, that is going to be valuable for them. And that's what drove our participation. Just sending out like, Hey, if you have any questions, let us know. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't really drive like actual good participation in those, those groups or, or meetings. Um, so it was always, um, make sure to, to lead the discussion with these are the things that are changing or that we need to do, or that we need to talk about. And then how does that impact you? What thoughts do you have on that? And, and opening the conversation in that way. Yeah, I think that's good. And we recommend like, lunch and learns and, and things like that, any kind of informal communications, you cannot over communicate when you're trying to build an internal community of practice, like having stuff as open and available as possible for everyone who, who wants to know stuff about it. And sometimes that means office hours where people come and ask questions. Sometimes that means, you know, getting together and doing like Zoom code review where, you know, your senior people walk through code review on cookbooks or whatever it is for the junior people to sort of learn how things work. Like all that stuff helps promote your preferred practices internally and help people be more comfortable with what you're doing. I think um, from my perspective, having office hours is important because nobody really reads email. And if you do and you can put it aside for later, it just becomes unactionable. So. To me, uh, having office hours is, is basically providing an easy button for people to do the right thing. They can hop in, get the quick feedback they need, they can iterate quickly, you know, and it just makes it so much easier to just follow best practices when you have that set up. Yeah, and um, kind of going along with those lines uh, that you said, Mandy, too, is is sort of those lunch and learns. Um, we, we often did town hall, monthly town halls and it is about practicing that stuff. It's about just being consistent with having those events. Like just, you can't do it here and there. You have to be consistent, whether it's once a week, whether it's once a month, however those are, um, have those discussions, just, just be consistent about it. Absolutely. And you need to like elevate stuff to the organizational wide meetings that you might have access to as well. Like yeah. being able to say quarterly in the all hands, right. For the whole organization, Hey, here's where we are with X, Y, Z project or, it will upgrade or blah 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 so that anybody who might be tangential also knows like that's also important excellent um i know there's a lot of discussion or sometimes um some feedback whether uh you know you should start a community of practice or a center of excellence um i also heard a uh, a um a great coe uh line called a, a center of enablement which is which is kind of a pretty cool take on it um, trying to get away from the excellence and, and forcing down. But uh, any thoughts in, on um, or opinions on communities of practice and naming it that or versus a center of excellence? Um, what's better? Why? Do you want the hashtag Brittany has opinions? Uh, yes. Get that you? soapbox out. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Hang on. Let me go. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so um, I would say like, I prefer to refer to these, these internal initiatives that I've been a part of as a community of practice. And I say that because whenever I hear or see center of excellence, it feels exclusionary. 
And if you're trying to promote a platform across your organization and, and get people involved, um, you want that feeling of community. Um, you want, um, like I very much firmly believe in like internal, almost open source communities where you're opening up your code and where you're allowing others to contribute and have, have a vested interest and vested stake in the future of that platform. So it is successful um, because otherwise, you know, nobody's going to want to use it. And whenever you put center of excellence connotation on there, it sounds like there's a group that's been pre-selected of people that are SMEs or whatever that are going to be doing the bits instead of saying, come, like, come to me and be a part of this, this initiative. Center of excellence can be a, a little bit harder <laughs> to, to get set up as an organization, right? Because you need kind of that, that higher level support, whether it's funding so you can establish staffing or what have you, but it becomes more of a dedicated thing that you actually need to allocate for in an organization. Yeah, I think that's true. But if you're in an organization that already has sort of an established practice of COEs for other stuff, if you have a COE for functional programming language runtimes or whatever else already exists like read the room a little bit maybe and like there there's already a paved path for for doing something like that you could start there obviously um because sometimes with coes when i've seen those in practice like they come with budget right like there's there's like money there usually in those large organizations that have that kind of established practice and like you totally want that right like yep. you you want some of that support to bring in you know, help or speakers or do an activity or buy donuts or whatever else you're doing in real life, right? Uh, so uh, if it's available, take some funds uh, if, if that's part of your organizational practice already. Um, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with all those. Uh, I, did, I did hear that uh, center of enablement, which I, I like better than and center of excellence because it, you are enabling the people that are using the tool as opposed yeah. to excellence has this like perfect um response and like nothing's ever perfect <laughs> so like when you have enablement you're actually helping people um commit to that as opposed to saying this is it this is the way do it this way and and i do agree like that practice and and using the word community is really important instead of having that center it's 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 everybody together so even if you do have um, if, if you do have that the group that is sort of maintaining and managing, especially in Chef, the, the processes in which code has to get to where it needs to go. So we're in, we can be really be anything like anybody who's managing and maintaining that CICD pipeline where you have checks in it and it's very rigid of what you have to have. Like everything has to be secure. Everything has to pass um, all of its linting checks before you can push it. So there's, there has to be sort of a driving factor and things that aren't as flexible. But if you build the community of practice around that, around that group, then that gives you a way to listen to what the community is saying and adjust your processes accordingly or say, hey, we do it this way, but we kind of have to and, and here's why. But again, going back to like just having that constant communication really helps in those. Yeah, like the the final thing i just wanted to say like along the lines of the point that i made was just i think this is a good situation or or a good example of language having power and the language you decide to use kind yeah. of helps you meet whatever goal you're trying to meet yeah. um and so i i think there i don't think that a center of excellence is bad i think it has its place um, but like in the, in the context and, and connotation of like the stuff that I've done, it made more sense to call it community to foster, foster that messaging. Yeah. Um, th does anybody, or do you all, have you created internal training programs uh, around that domain or folks within the community, uh, set up their, the training specifically for, um, that, that particular practice or that particular, uh, um, domain that they're working in? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I didn't. I didn't want to be the first to jump in, uh, but um, yeah. So uh, in a in a past life, um, and even in a current life, really, um, and if we if we were to just narrow this down to Chef, um, like Chef is very big platform with a lot of 
a lot of things to learn up front uh, and a lot of practices to teach before somebody can even begin to be successful. Um, so setting up basically uh, inform not an information session. It was more of like a, a day long boot camp, but you can split it up over multiple sessions of, you know, this is what the environment is. And this is what these words mean. It does not mean I'm taking you out to lunch. Like your Google will eventually learn. You're not looking for, you know, a chef, right? Um, so, so getting everybody on the same page of the language that you're using and ensuring that they're set up for success and then following that with some, some way for them to get their hands dirty in, in that like session environment where you're there with them. Um, because one of the most powerful things I found in promoting these training programs is, um, even if somebody feels like they have a good understanding of the platform itself and a good understanding of what their, the expectations are around them using it, they're still in like enterprise environments where they might touch production. There's still this fear that, oh God, I'm going to break things. And so I always add that or tack that like hands-on learning at the end, not so not only so people can get used to doing the things we're asking of them and, and the process, but also so that they can see I knew zero things and I broke nothing. Um, so the next time they push code out or contribute to the environment, they understand that like it's safe to do so um, and that they can contribute regardless of their level of knowledge. Yeah. And with something like Chef too, like so many of the the features and the work that you're going to do on it to make it nicer for you and in your environment are going to make it harder for someone who knows like vanilla chef to come in and learn all of it right like you have all of your site cookbooks and all of the things that you've customized and the rules that you're using and whatever you're working on and that just makes that further along from someone who knows chef as a product doesn't know chef in your environment and like I can tell you like no two, they could be doing the exact same stack and no two sets of cookbooks will be exactly the same. So having that kind of training there that gives folks an on-ramp into all the things that you're, you're going to help them with, but they need to know that they're there and how to use them, how to use them well, so that they're not fiddling around digging through layers and layers of, of libraries and cookbooks and everything else. Yeah, it's, it's a quick way to, to help share patterns that you've established to increase agility within your organization that may not come with Vanilla Chef, to, to your point. Um, and I think any, any organization is going to establish those patterns just to make their teams faster. And they're always going to do it in a way that makes most sense for that environment. So it's so critical. Yeah, our... Um... Our training programs or our free training that we have at uh, learn.chef.io, um, it's a great starting place. Um, I know previously I found that it's, it is, it's like, it's a great to get a baseline, but there are times, and especially around these community of practices where you do have a centralized um, promotion pipeline, like all of the, the commands and the interactions that you do directly with the chef server are hopefully all taken care of for you. So you really need to not just focus, you, you, you don't need to focus on being how, being able to push your cookbooks to the chef server because only automation should be doing that really anyway, um, mm -hmm. or very, very limited people that, that can go through and review cookbooks and push that, you know, that should all be in a pipeline. Um, hopefully that's all set up for folks, but then it's, it's really teaching them how to um, utilize GitHub and how your promotion process works and just like write basic, basic cookbooks and, and do the testing, like learn how to do local testing and, and try not to touch your environment whatsoever. Um, I, I, that is one of the training programs that I wrote is, you know, Hey, this is how GitHub works because a lot of the people that we were, that were starting to do cookbook development came from the ops side. Like it was a very ops heavy DevOps group. Um, so we really had to kind of teach GitHub. We had to teach, uh, how to push, how not to use the master branch forever, the main branch for everything. Like, you know, those little steps of getting from being an operator to understanding a little bit of source code to actually be able to write something and push that. There, there was so much that was taken care of, like from a, how this actually, all the, all the, all the uh, stuff that was cooking in the, in the pipeline and you didn't have to worry about any of that. You just had to write some cookbooks, test it locally, push it. So, you know, that was very particular. And yeah, everybody has their own little, little ways of, of doing that code. Yeah, I will say like for all the years that I worked at Chef, like one of the things that came up the most was that 
customers asked us if we could give them Git training. Like, mm, that's outside our wheelhouse, but we'll point <laughs> you in the right direction. Yep. Yeah. I think uh, technology just has become so vast with certain things these days. I mean, Chef is is big enough that we're already pinpointing that. But if you look at something like AWS, that's just, if you say, hey, you, you don't know AWS that well, or you don't know Chef, just like go here and learn the the likelihood of them getting really useful information to apply. It, it's going to be like, 10% maybe, in my opinion, you know, having those workshops and those communities of practice really helps people focus in on what they need to know to be effective. Yeah. So uh, next up, I just wanted to like kind of talk about like what the time commitment, if you run a community of practice currently, um, sort of what what would someone if, if they wanted to start a community of practice up and, and, and take on that leadership role, um, what kind of time commitment do you think uh, they would be looking at? I I mean, I guess it d depends on what you actually are, are looking for first. You, you're probably going to start with a Slack channel and, or, you know, a channel or whatever your chat is and invite people in. And when you get to some quorum, say, hey, let's meet Friday afternoon for some chat and office hours or whatever and then build from there. So it's gonna start out probably pretty sparse and then maybe gain momentum uh, as you bring more people on board. So starting out with a couple of hours a month and then you really have to watch it. Like at some point you you may be asked to justify this, right, to your boss. So you have to make sure that what you're doing is helping everyone along and gaining success for other teams and all of those kinds of things. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, it could snowball into like most of a full-time job. If you end up getting to a place where you want to do like a dojo practice or something like that, that builds out of it. So yeah, being conscious of, you know, what you're able to commit is fine and starting small. I think a lot of it has to do with the size of the community too. Um, you know, I, I think that kind of really determines how fast it's going to grow. Um, I, I completely agree, though, starting out as like a, a some kind of just messaging channel where you can start exchanging ideas and figure out exactly what makes most sense for your practice that you're trying to um, establish a community around. Um, you know, you, you might have 10 teams that are all trying to work together and instead of having it one big workshop, maybe for a couple hours a week or whatever, you might want to break that down on a per team basis to get, you know, effective training out of it and kind of work on that scope. So that might bloom into something a little bit more time and in, uh, intensive because of that. So. Yeah, I pretty, I pretty of, much oh, echo that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, go no ahead. I pretty, uh, I pretty much echo that. Like, uh, it can start off really small. Like if if you have, you know, thoughts of grandeur in mind at the beginning, obviously it's going to be more of a time commitment, but like it can start off if, if you go with like a grassroots community effort, it starts off very small, but then as that community grows, so does its needs. Um, so does the need to, you know, not necessarily have a figurehead, but to have somebody that's that's organizing somebody that's, you know, putting together whatever needs to be put together. And so then naturally that, can become a big effort um and so really it can become as big as you want it to um but like my recommendation from like i also have a like another set of responsibilities outside of like any kind of community responsibilities um i i wouldn't recommend a single person trying to spearhead that effort far beyond like building it um right. once it becomes an actual active community um, I think that having engagement from others is important. Yeah, a couple of things there, like um, the whole idea of the, and time commitment, um, like this should be a community because we're, we're building a community of practice here. Uh, so like everyone does need to pitch in, everyone needs to volunteer a little bit of their time uh, when we talk about those training programs, right? Like build and develop that in, in using code so that anybody can contribute it use a use an mk docs or, or docsars or some sort of like um document driven training um tool or even just information tool 
and let that drive so that everybody can contribute when there are changes to how things are done. Anyone can put those in and promote those in an open source mentality. Um, so that's that's definitely uh, an important thing to do. And and likewise, when you're when you're building those town halls, like it's not just one person or one one group that's saying, "Hey, this is what we're going to talk about." Like you need you need input from everybody to come talk about. It. Everybody needs to come do a demo or show off what they they learned that month. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's how communities work. That's how meetup groups work. Like tr taking that principle and pulling it into a corporate environment and treating that domain the same way it's, it's, it is, it's the same. Oh, so. uh, last one on my list and we'll kind of open it up. If you guys have any other, um, topics or, or questions or things you wanted to, uh, drop in here, but, um, curious how you reward your community, because that's one thing that is important that those that are participating um they they get something out of it besides just helping other people but you know that's i like doing that i like helping other people so that's that's sort of my reward um but what are other ways that you can reward your your undying gratitude <laughs> <laughs> i've definitely seen teams do um swag right shirts stickers the usual sort of identify me as part of this crowd sort of ideas for, for stuff like that sort of customized with company logo plus the product logo those sorts of things so yeah like we have we have swag we have a, a bit of a mascot internally and um it's a dog. And so we've, we've got this dog that's wearing a chef hat and has a little skillet, you know, so we, you know, we have, we have a uh, swag that was designed like in the past too. I also, um, in my, in my previous role, we did, uh, something of like, they weren't necessarily sarcastic awards, but we did a little bit of awards at the end of the year. Um, and so they were very non-conventional. Uh, so it wasn't like we had a few that was like first pull request of the year or whatever, but then we had one uh, called babysitters club. And that was because there was, you know, somebody that knew there were problems before we did. We had one called fastest trigger finger because he approved pull requests the fastest. Um, so like I nobody really those. knew <laughs> what they were going to get. Um, but like, I mean, we had real awards too, but nobody really knew what they were going to get. So maybe they would get first pull request or maybe they were going to get babysitters club. Like it was a, it was a, it was a game kind of, <laughs> and they had a medal and everything. Like we got them like a little medal and um, a donut. Uh, if you like donuts. <laughs> that sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> I think on a, on a, granular level too you know just making people more interested in participating things simple things like lunch and learns type of thing turning a workshop into more than just a workshop you know everybody likes food <laughs> um so I, I think that's an easy way to to get people at least in the door but you know having kind of a wrap-up like award shows is, is a great idea too and if you have a like the the sort of corporate structure where you do kudos or you can have like little peer thank yous or any of those things like make sure you're doing those for the yep. folks that are are working on that because a community of practice often like like i mentioned earlier like it's unremunerated right it's not really part of your main job most of the time so like mm -hmm. make sure that you are like attaboying everybody who's participating in the formal channels so that their managers know, hey, this is yep. useful to us. This is valuable to the organization. This is really setting us ahead of what we need to be doing so that that they can continue to do that. Yeah, what's really cool about those too is that they are they are public uh, public facing. So a lot of times your your company will list all the, you know, have a rolling list of who's yeah. getting um, kudos, uh, bravos, whatever the award system is. And, you know, they get recognized, but also everyone sees that oh there's a community of practice so you kind of sell your community based around that too yeah so awesome all right um I, that's through my list of topics today um anybody else have any parting words or anything they wanted to, to say about communities of practice i mean if you're thinking about it just go for it good advice 
Hey, Brittany. Uh, I, I, I don't have a super lot to add like to the end. Um, I, I will say that, uh, I, I talked about the construct of like trying to look at the environments as open source. And so I think like, as you run these, it, it can become like a transparent facet at your organization. Like, even if your organization like feels stuffy or whatever, like you can, you can open these up and make them feel super transparent. So even if you're not, um, like functionally able to reward somebody right up front, for example, like allowing people to see that their their contributions are actually going somewhere um, is a little bit of a reward in itself. And the more transparently you can run these, being op open, upfront, honest, and and receptive of change, I think the more successful the the community of practice can become. Um, especially in its early stages, because if people see that they're making an impact in some way, they're going to continue trying to make an impact. I agree. It, it helps enforce that they're doing the right thing, that, you know, everyone is appreciative, you know, their work is valued. And I think ultimately everyone just wants to work somewhere where they know they're valued too at the end of the day. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's awesome. Um, appreciate everybody's time today. Um, if anybody has more uh, wants to find out more, wants to have a discussion about communities of practice, they can certainly filter that through me at Chef, um, michael.butler at, at progress.com. Uh, we'll help you there. You can also reach out in our community Slack or on um, you can reach me on LinkedIn. So we'll also put a little blob on this. Uh, everybody can be reached through uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, all those places. So feel free to reach out to us. Um, again, thank you, Mandy, Nate, Brittany been uh, a good time i hope everybody is is enjoyed this and uh is, is having an awesome uh chef comp thanks everyone thank you everyone